All right, let's look at the uh, assignment number 10. And uh, we're dealing with uh, uh, Mark 4 through Mark 5. And the four miracles that are framed by the calling of the disciples and then the commission of the disciples. And the miracles are also framed by various people who were rejecting and attacking Jesus, correct? Yes. And so, what we have here, I'll try to uh, zoom in a little bit, make it a little bigger for us. So, the main thing here was to see the flow of Mark. Mark is revealing something to us about Jesus in answer to the charges against Jesus' character or personage and ministry. So the two great charges against Jesus were what? He's crazy, he's crazy and he's possessed, right? He's a demon-possessed crazy man yeah. <laughs> which means he'd have qualified to be a rapper today yeah. <laughs> or a rock star or mm -hmm. something like that now answer the following questions what is the occasion that gives rise to the episode to these miracles he's a crazy demoniac man what is the setting of each of these miracles so let's look at the first one here and we go by the parables and the first one deals with Jesus uh, stills the sea so the setting is stormy sea stormy sea mm -hmm. who's in the boat Jesus, disciples. Jesus and the disciples uh, how many of these disciples would have been at home in the sea more, at, least. at least four of them, at least. I don't know if Matthew, the tax collector, ever uh, got his sea legs underneath him. But you got many of these men are from Galilee. They are as familiar probably in a boat as they are on land. And all of a sudden there arose a fierce gale of wind. Now. This can happen uh, quite easily. And um, I probably, uh, with more time, I could show you the slides and everything. But I'll just do a little drawing. So, all right. In their day, they had the little Lake Hula. The Jordan River came down. There was other tributaries coming down from way up here is the mountains, Mount Hermon area. Hermon, M-O-R-M-O-N. Then you have the Sea of Galilee, and then the Jordan River goes out from that all the way down to the Dead Sea. For every mile the Jordan River goes north and south, it goes east and west about two and a half to three miles. So it is a windy, windy road, or uh, lake. This has got, should be out a little bit further, like this, okay? Now, a little wider here, there we go. Now, up here is the Mediterranean, all right? The Mediterranean and coming off the Mediterranean always from the northwest are winds along this area of the Sea of Galilee there are two big high hills called the horns of Hattin they're called that because that's where Suleiman the Magnificent defeated the Crusaders and ended up taking over the uh, land of Israel. But the winds, you see, coming off the Mediterranean are uh, 
often warmer winds coming off the, or colder winds coming off the Mediterranean. They come up the mountains and then they come down through this valley. And this valley is called the Valley of the Doves or the Valley of the Winds because all the air currents are up here. These are birds flying, just kind of soaring around. And there are air currents that come up. So what you end up having is, and of course the Sea of Galilee is about 600 feet below sea level. So you have this wind uh, coming up off the cool air, coming off the Mediterranean, coming up in the mountains, and then it comes rushing down and hits the hot air of the Sea of Galilee. It hits all this hot air here, and then it's forced up over more mountains here, called the Golan Heights, all right? And so what happens very, very quickly and very, very often is the cold air of the mountains meets the hot air of the Galilee Basin being forced up, and it creates a crashing of the winds, and it creates these big, big waves. The Sea of Galilee is about six to seven miles wide, about 12 to 13 miles long. And almost any day of the week, you can windsurf from up here all the way down to there because of the winds coming off the Valley of the Doves. So this was something that happened quite often to the disciples when they were out fishing. All the fishing villages, we'll use green for fishing villages, all the fishing villages are up along this area. I got them in the, they're up along this area. Why are the fishing villages up here? Upwind. Pardon me? Upwind. Well, a bit upwind, but the Jordan River is coming down. Those of you who are fishermen, you know, it's the Jordan River is constantly bringing the food down, right? The streams are constantly bringing the food down. Anytime I go fishing, I look for a stream that brings the food down. That's where the fish will gather. And so all the fishing villages were up here. So they would get these winds all the time. So this was not unusual for them to experience. But there was something very unusual about this storm, wasn't there? Raphael? Just one question, Dr. Plain. Yeah. The, the fishing boat that they found in Galilee, was that indicative of yeah. the size of a fishing boat that was in? Yeah, wow. yeah, very, very typical. Wow. The one that they found, uh, you know, they called it the Jesus boat right away. And, you know, people, oh, this was one that Jesus must have been on. There were a lot of boats that were sunk uh, around 73 A.D., 70 to, what was it, 72, 73 A.D., um, by, up in that fishing village area by the Romans during the rebellion of the uh, uh, Jews against the Romans. Uh, let's see, Jerusalem fell in 70 A.D., Masada fell in 73 A.D., uh, so it would have been right around 70 AD. I'm trying to remember if they knocked them out before or after the fall of Jerusalem. I think it was after the fall of Jerusalem. So, um, so we have a lot, you know, going on there. So, but in this one, it, there arose a fierce gale of winds, and the waves were breaking over the boat. Now, Mark is writing, but who is Mark's source according to church history? Peter. Yeah. Peter. So Peter can, Peter can tell you this was just not any normal storm, right? Uh, and, of course, Jesus was in the stern. Where is the stern of the boat? The front or the back? The back. The back, right? You got, what is it, the port? The bow, I mean, in the stern, the port, and the starboard. So he's in the back of the boat. And if you want to be in a boat during a storm, where's the best place to be? The back. The back. Because the front is doing this more than anything, right? The front is always 
going up and down more. You want to be in the middle, like where Jonah was. Jonah went down into the bottom of the ship into the middle because that's the least tossed place. I remember a few years ago, I was coming back on a plane. There was a young couple. They had gone on a honeymoon on a boat cruise. I asked them how the cruise was. They said, well, for us, it was fantastic. Uh, but for everybody else, they all got sick. I said, why? They said, we hit a great big storm. But they said, we had the cheapest room on the whole ship. We were in the very bottom, in the very middle. And while all the people who had spent all the money for the outside cabins with the windows and everything, you know, and the front view, they got tossed around the most, which meant they tossed around the most. Know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And, and so they were in the middle. They hardly got bumped around so that when it came for like for two or three days, they were pra practically alone at the buffet because <laughs> everybody else was sick. Now, uh, of course, Jesus rebukes it. The wind dies down and becomes perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see how Mark is setting up the reader to think the same thing? And what is the answer to that? Who is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Is he a crazy man? Is he uh, a demonic man? In fact, you know, a lot of superstition said that the demons or evil spirits dwelt in the depths of the sea. So what does this teach us uh, about uh, Jesus? Uh, what is the setting? Uh, what does each miracle reveal? So what does this miracle tell us about Jesus? <coughs> Chris? Okay, um, I say... That it shows his divine, his divine authority being able to control nature. Right. Also, he fulfills the Psalm 107, 29, and defining his divine equality in Psalm 89, 9, and 65, 67. All right. Uh, the main thing, though, is his power, his divinity so, over nature, so, over the sea, mm -hmm. at the very least over the sea. If you say nature, then you're, you know, it's much broader, but over the sea. Well, he did calm the winds also. Yes, over the winds. Yes. Yeah, because you calm the winds, winds, you calm the sea. So, all right. So how does this miracle answer Jesus' critics, right? He's not a crazy man. He's not uh, uh, controlled by uh, demons. Now, the next one we go to is the demoniac of the Gerizines. And you have to notice um, how Mark labors at the description of this. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerizines. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit <laughs> met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. That's not a place the Jews were allowed to hang out, was it? No, no. Peter, why couldn't Jews hang out there? They would become unclean. They would become unclean. And no one was able to bind him anymore. Not even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Can you sense Mark laboring this point? The absolute human helplessness of it all? I mean, he could have said it very shortly. No one was able to bind him. But he goes into, you know, this elaborate deep, convincing the reader. Constantly, day and night, he was screaming among the tombs in the mountains, gnashing himself with, gashing himself with stones. 
Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God, do not torment me. How does this answer <laughs> Jesus' critics? Right? Pretty. Jesus said what? Satan cannot be against Satan. A house cannot be divided against his house. What is Jesus doing? He can't be from Satan. He's tearing down the house. And the demons are giving this great testimony as to who he is. In contrast to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's not a crazy man. He is the most high God. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. He was asking him, What is your name? And he said, My name is Legion. Now that doesn't mean that there was, you know, 600, 1,000. You know, legions just like our battalions had different numbers. But it meant that we are many. There was many, many. He began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. For there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby in the mountain. What's wrong with a large herd of swine? Unclean. Unclean. It's not kosher food. <laughs> I remember years ago the rabbis uh, had a big discussion. They found some uh, pig-like animal that had multiple stomachs, but it still had cloven hoofs, but it tasted like ham. And they were trying to make it clean, you know? So uh, uh, my uh, grandfather used to... Uh, uh, work in the Royal Oak area and when he would take me to work we'd go into the delis over there the, I mean Oak Park in the Oak Park area which was very Jewish and you'd hear you'd have the Jewish people come in you'd hear them say give me a kosher chicken sandwich you know what that meant bacon lettuce and tomato but it, they, they they would say if you don't know what you're eating it's not a violation <laughs> the, the, the things people will do to try to get around it so, well, uh, the demons implored him, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Uh, Jesus gave them permission. Coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine. The herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea. About 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Did Jesus do anything wrong here? <coughs> no. You know, people accuse Jesus of doing wrong. Oh, you... You know, you killed all these animals, or you ruined their business, or whatever. That's why they like Two points. Number one, we already know that the swine weren't supposed to be there, right? Mm -hmm. But secondarily, they're not talking about Porky Pig like we know. <laughs> um, history has shown that they had a swine-like pig animal that actually when frightened or scared of an approaching enemy would go into the water and was able to swim until they felt safe and then they could come out. So these swine did not die of natural causes. The suggestion is that, uh, as, as you might know, when a demon possesses a body, it has to stay there until the body dies. Once the body dies, then they are freed again to go rehabilitate something else. So the suggestion is, is that the evil spirits or demons caused the herd to die. Yes? No, no explicit statement. No explicit statement. Other than two things. It was more compassionate to let them go into the swine than to go free amongst other people as a judgment to the, to the community for their unbelief and the fact that they were violating the law by having these unclean animals he allowed them to die, and he did not bind the spirits to um, 
to the pit uh, because of a judgment upon the area. Now that's all like conjecture because the text doesn't clearly state it. So the herdsmen run away and report in the city and in the country and the people came to see what had happened. Now what has happened, what is the result of Jesus' work with this demoniac? What, what state is he in now? He's in his right mind. Before he was crazy. Is Jesus a crazy man? No. Does Jesus make people crazy? No. No. Jesus heals the crazy people. He heals the demoniacs. He, it's the exact opposite of all of the accusations against him. Selectivity, arrangement, purpose, all of that you can see in Mark's writing. He has purposely chosen these four miracles, particularly this one. They who had seen it described them to them how it all happened to the demon-possessed man and about the swine. They began to implore him to leave their region. You know, wow. Here Jesus has just healed public enemy number one. You'd think they'd be thankful. I mean, the reader is going to be reading and saying, why aren't these people thankful? Jesus is doing good stuff, and they want him to leave? How does that reflect back on the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are attacking him? You know, they want Jesus to leave. They want Jesus to take off. But they're the ones that should probably take off. They're the crazy people. As he was getting to the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. He did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people. Report to them what great things who? Lord. The Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And what did he do? He went away, began to proclaim in Decapolis. What does Decapolis mean? Ten cities. Deca, ten polis cities. What great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. Now, this is not in the Bible, but this is in early church history. One of the areas that responded to Christianity the fastest in the early church was the area of Decapolis, an area where we have no knowledge of the Jewish apostles going. But this was an area that responded to Christianity and established churches very, very early. It's only suggestion, but it sounds like this guy had a credible testimony and witness. You know, a lot of times, that's one of the most powerful evangelistic tools. I was a sinner. Jesus made me a saint. Let me tell you what he's doing in my life. He can do it for you, too. Just a simple testimony. Everybody can share that. Well, then we go on to our next two miracles. Jesus crosses back over in the boat. The crowd sees him. And, and, of course, if you've ever had a chance to go to the, to the uh, Sea of Galilee in that region, the Sea of Galilee is like a bowl of ice cream. You know, the, the, the uh, lake is in the bottom, and it's surrounded by mountains. And anywhere along that mountain, you can see the beautiful picture of the entire sea. I mean, it's just panoramic. It, it's like... You know, being in an airplane and, over, and flying over it. You can see the whole thing. You can see what's going on. So the people see him. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus. I don't care if you call him Jairus or Jairus or Jerry. <laughs> came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and leave. So we got another setting, another group. So we've gone from the 12 disciples, right, to a demoniac, now to a, you know, a, a, a hallowed a synagogue official. He went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. 
Now we drop back down to, and I'm sorry, ladies, but in that culture, a woman, you know, and a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years, a woman who was unclean, so on and so forth. Mike, do you have a... Yeah, I tried finding in here or in some, something somewhere what a, what a synagogue official... Right. What that title meant. Right. To me, he came in the middle of a crowd and fell at Jesus' feet and said, heal my daughter, and to me, a synagogue official might have been somebody where that would have been, he would have taken some risk in, I mean, I don't know that, I can't find it anywhere, well, but... Well, generally speaking, a synagogue official is understood as maybe uh, one of the elders of the synagogue, but also very often somebody who has contributed significant wealth or monies for the building or the support of the synagogue. So the understanding would be that he would be putting himself in jeopardy or in that jeopardy. Right? In jeopardy in what way? Well, they would take a risk seeking out Jesus and falling at his feet with this crowd oh, around him. Well, certainly. I mean, in Jerusalem, they would have wanted to have stoned him. Yeah. Up in Galilee, he, you know, was uh, Jesus was not as unpo was not as un unpopular. Yes. Uh, so this woman, we had seen this passage before, right? Had endured much at the hands of many physicians, just labors on this. Uh, had spent all of her money. That was before Obamacare. <laughs> she had and was not helped at all. That was under current tort reform, but rather had grown worse. All these doctors had made it worse yeah. for her. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? Because Jesus did not have omniscience. Is Jesus lacking omniscience here? No. Does Jesus not know who touched him? Yes. yes. Then why does he ask the question? So that they can, so they can, so that they can learn from it, right? Because... We know in verse 32 that Jesus looks around to find the woman because she's kind of backed out and backed away. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? And I can really imagine these words coming out of Peter's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if Peter is the background of telling Mark, I mean, there's not too many people that could report the speech. Uh, this was just like uh, Tony Evans said today. What did he say? Something like uh, he hoped that Peter wore candy cane socks because his foot was in his mouth so much. <laughs> you know, that he at least have something to taste. Uh, or maybe he said cinnamon socks, something like that. But I won't steal his material. So, <clears throat> Jesus looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. <clears throat> Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So, what we have here is, again, is this a demoniac man? No. Is this a crazy man? No. But you know. be considered crazy at one point. He said, you touch me. That, that would substantiate some of the things. You're going to be crazy again. Right. At that point. Sure. Uh, when he said, who touched me in the midst of that whole pressing crowd here? And, and yet Jesus... Jesus knows it all. I mean, people are just wanting to be near him, get his autograph. Now, while he was speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? What did this delegation of people, including the synagogue, what did they believe about Jesus, and what did they not believe about Jesus? They believed that Jesus could heal the living. The what? The living. Yeah. The, the, the living. The living. The living. But he could not raise the dead. Right? Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, 
said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. Really, this, this could be, this is much shorter in the original language. It's stop fearing, believe. Very strong imperatives. Stop fearing, believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official and he saw a commotion, people loudly weeping and wailing. This was very, very normal. In fact, the Talmud, the Jewish kind of what to do in certain circumstances, says that if you don't have any family living, that you have to hire professional mourners. And you have to hire at least one musician to play a dirge, uh, you know, at the funeral. Well, entering in, he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him, better mocking him. Yeah. But putting them all out, he took the child's father and mother and his own companions, entered the room where the child was, taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Is this a crazy man? Nope. You know? Now, was Jesus lying when he said, um, the child has not died but is asleep? No, he didn't. Why isn't he lying? Because it was his perspective. Well, it was from his perspective. And Jesus uses a second term which which can refer to death. Like, uh, I'll, like years ago uh, when I was in Chelsea, one of my elders uh, called me. And uh, he said uh, to me, he says, I uh, uh, just wanted to let you know I was new in the community. You know, Joe Franklin bought the farm. I said to him, oh, really? Where is the farm located? Uh, he said, it's on the north side of town. Uh, I said, oh, is, is, there, is it very much acreage? He says, no, it's a pretty small plot. I didn't know that bought the farm was a figure of speech for that he died. But this guy had a great laugh for about five minutes or so, you know, going on. So uh, there was a hand that I didn't, uh, no? Okay. So this is a figure of speech that, you know, Jesus could be uh, referring to. Uh, then immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. He gave strict orders that no one would know about this. You see this concealment theme throughout the book of Mark and in some of the Gospels where Jesus says, I just don't want you telling everybody about this. And there is one explanation in the scriptures as to why. Do you know what it is? Yeah. Pardon me? It wasn't, time. it wasn't his time. And he didn't want everybody dragging their dead relatives <laughs> out and bringing them to him. Mike? <laughs> Some people are better off dead. <laughs> Some people are better off dead. I think part of it was, um, pardon me, it could be, yeah, I, I don't know how much we can make of the 12, but I would say the idea that she was able to get up and walk around, that this wasn't a smaller infant that could have gone into a deep sleep or into, you know, a coma or something like this, um, but he also says, and he said that something should be given to her to eat. So why would he say to her, give her something to eat? <laughs> could be a very practical thing. Yeah, Phil? Well, it could be proof that she, that she was alive. She's alive. Like when he said, touch my, touch my scars and see that right. I'm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really here. Part part of you know, uh, she is alive. Um, she's been sick. She needs some nutrition. Mm-hmm. Uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, okay. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's hard work. So, here again, is this a crazy man? You know, and and so on and so forth. Then notice, we again, we close out this section with Jesus went out from there, came into his hometown, his disciples followed him. He catches flack from this. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph? I mean, Joseph is not around. Are not his sisters here? Now, you do know the Catholic uh, folks don't like this verse. No. Why? Why don't they like this verse? Because Pardon me? You say Mary was a perpetual virgin. Yeah, they want to say Mary was a perpetual virgin. And you know, that whole argument breaks down because if Mary had to be a perpetual virgin, then her perpetual virgin, then her mother had to be a perpetual virgin, and her mother had to be a perpetual virgin. Um, But they try to call these cousins of uh, Mary. So, pardon? I've I've heard uh, stepbrothers or stepsisters. Yeah. Yeah, well, they see, it, it, even stepbrothers or stepsisters, they don't like if they came from Mary. they got to keep Mary uh, holy. Yeah. holy. Pure. So, uh, but notice, you got at least four brothers, mm-hmm. James being the oldest, probably, because he's in the list first, and then uh, at least two sisters. So, so, I mean, we don't know when Joseph died, but... Um, uh, at least he was busy in the meantime. Yes, he was. <laughs> so. Well, we know he was still alive when Jesus was 13. 13, yes. He didn't burn. So, no, he didn't burn. <laughs> Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, among his own relatives, so on and so forth. And then it closes out with the uh, sending of the uh, 12. So I hope you can see the design selectivity, arrangement, purpose, adaptation, and all of those things. Now, one of the last questions that I asked on this, and, and this is a, you know, this is a bit of conjecture, but was there any big thread that you saw or commonalities? What commonalities are there that may tie all of these miracles together? Many? Uh, that Jesus was a problem solver. Certainly, Jesus was a problem solver. That's mm-hmm. going down the road uh, quite well. Uh, Charnay? Gloria. Gloria, I'm sorry. I, I was mixed up with Charnay. Is, is Charnay here tonight? Yeah. Oh, there she is back there. That's what threw me off. All of the results were immediate. Yes, Gloria. All the results were immediate. Yes. Yes, Mike, and then Nathan. All the problems were completely out of everybody's control. There's nothing anybody can do to get out of the situation on their own. Did, did you get that sense of every one of these <clears throat> were helpless, hopeless situations in which humanity had exhausted themselves? I'm sure the guys at sea had done everything that they could. The people of the community had done everything that they could. The woman, at the, the woman with the issue of blood had done everything that she could. And the synagogue official, when he heard the word that his daughter had died, he figured he had done everything that he could. Uh, and, and that was it. Nate? Um, all the miracles demonstrate Jesus' um, power and validity. Absolutely. First one, power over the wind and sea. Second one, power over... Demons and spirits. Third one, power over sickness. Fourth one, power over death. Is that a crazy demoniac? No. Could I have one more? Yes. Last one also, to have all this power, but yet to remain humble and meek. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, very much the servant throughout. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, um, Mike and then uh, Rod. You know, I, I think in each of the cases, they 
somebody had a measure of faith and reached out to Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, was there any faith in the in the boat? No. no, no. <laughs> that might be the only one that. Uh, they woke him up. Pardon me. They woke yeah, they did wake him up. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Jesus. Rod and then that's, Aaliyah. That's kind of what I was going to say too. There, it seemed like there was a little bit of a contrast between fear and faith. You know? Fear and faith. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Aaliyah. Maybe they weren't seeking, or maybe they were seeking, maybe not faith, but they were seeking. You, you mean in the boat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, they definitely were wondering why he was back there relaxing so much. All characters. Pardon me? In each miracle. Yes. All characters were seeking Christ. Let's see. Someone from the story was seeking Christ. Was the demoniac yes. because of the demons? He ran. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Good. Good. Aaliyah? One of the other commonalities I, I found is that he was showing that the it was in he wasn't about religion because he, they didn't want him to heal the sick on a Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so okay. Was yes. It, you know, the only thing I, I couldn't determine is that whether or not how I was related to the wind and the sea, but all of them bowed down to the, to him. Uh-huh. The, the um, demonic man, he bowed down when he seen him. Uh, the late... Um, the woman came fearfully to him, yeah. And she she fell to, down to him. Uh huh. And then Jairus, uh, he also bowed down. Uh huh. But I couldn't determine if that was something that was relevant as far as the commonality. Well, it's a good commonality to see. I I ask you this question: Why do preachers and teachers feel like they have to make up? So many thoughts when this is such great material. <laughs> I mean, these are great stories. These are powerful stories the way yes, like Mark mm -hmm. meant them. Right. Now, does this say anything about marriage and family? No. Does this say anything about your financial problems? Mm -mm. No. Nope. Does this say anything about your <laughs> terrible boss? No. Nope. Does this say anything about your snot-nosed children? Well. Nope. No. <laughs> but you don't have to shotgun all the time. Right. Yeah. Right. If you yeah. teach the word of God yes. method in a in, in a methodological, consistent pattern, going through a book. You're going to cover all the topics. You're going to cover them from the authorial intent. And you know what? If somebody can understand from these miracles that Jesus is divine, he is the problem solver, he, he is the healer, then, then you understand that, yeah, you know, Jesus can help me in my situation, so on and so forth. And, and, and then you can make application at the end of it all. But don't turn the demoniac into somebody's wife. You know? Or the Jairus into the dominant husband. You know, preach it the way the author. It's such great material. Yes, Claire. Oh, sir, that's fine. All right. I was going to add just one. Gloria, then. And that part was, again, and uh, how Jesus just kept that servant attitude. Yes. All this right here. Yeah. He remained a servant. Yeah, I mean, he put on a pretty good show, didn't he? Yes, sir. <laughs> he could have gotten a little puffed up. Gloria. Well, why would you assume they would make the demoniac a wife? <laughs> so here is, because most of the preachers are men. <laughs> You know, <laughs> Can I that? No. <laughs> so, but 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 you 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 see what I what I'm trying to say here is this is powerful material. Yes. This is great teaching and preaching to talk about how God comes in the helpless, hopeless situations and helps those who find Him. This is answering because it's. I mean, if you go up and you talk to people today, I mean, you say, who is Jesus? You know, some historical figure, some crazy guy who thought he was God. You know, I got no clue who he is. Some fictional character from the past. So, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. You know, Islam, the illegitimate child of Mary, yeah. so on and so forth. This is the way it was intended to be preached and taught. This is where the greatest power and impact of the genuine work of the Holy Spirit can be used in the life of people. And you know what? If you preach it the way the text is written, it's a whole lot easier for the people to go back when they read it again and remember that that's what it was all about because it's not coming from your imagination, it's coming from the text. And it's textually driven. So, well, that felt good. <laughs> I'm glad I got that off my chest. <laughs> so, other comments for that before we close out this section. All right, let's take a break.